Season 11 starts now. He's a bail bondsman to the stars. From Robert Durst to Fat Joe, Ira Jettleson has made it his business to lend money to help famous people get out of jail. Today, the man who's been called the bank for bad guys reveals the latest on one of his most infamous clients, Harvey Weinstein, whose recent sentencing continues to make headlines. Ira shares exclusive details on another crime story that everyone's talking about, the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. What did Ira find out from a phone call he had with her estranged husband, Fotos Dulos, just hours before he took his own life? Ira Jettleson joins me now. And I've always wondered, maybe many of you have as well, what is a bondsman? So help us through that. Well, Dr. Oz, a, a bondsman is someone that lends money to people that have been arrested to get them out of jail. Uh, I am a bank for people that have been arrested to give them the opportunity to come out and fight their case from the outside. So I'm just curious, how, how does someone become a legal loan shark? That's what you're called sometimes. I, Did you come out of college thinking, I, I want to do this? <laughs> no, no, I've been involved in a lot of different businesses before this, but I got involved in the business a little over 20 years ago, um, and I got put on the map by a very high profile attorney that called me for DMX, uh, the rapper. I, I jumped to it, I got DMX out of jail as quick as possible, and then other different attorneys relied on me to be there for them. I did Ja Rule, I did Plaxico Burris, I did Fat Joe. And Fat Joe is my friend to this very day. We have a great relationship. And he's been on the show. He's a great man. I, I didn't realize he had bail bond issues earlier on, but. Well, jo jo Joe and me have become very, very close. He had some issues uh, in the legal system and, and I kind of consulted and helped him through everything. So as a good friend of mine, Dog the Bounty Hunter, that has made a name for himself going after these guys who have you know, escaped and avoid, avoiding the legal consequences. How is what you do related to what he does? Well, well, Dog's a bounty hunter. Uh, I, I am a bondsman. I, I, I lend the money. Uh, I don't really need to chase after him. Now, as a bondsman, I am a licensed bounty hunter. Dog's tactics are very good in Hawaii. I don't know how those tactics would work in the South Bronx or <laughs> in Harlem or in Brooklyn, you know, walking in there with a pellet gun. I, I, you know, it's a, it's a different breed of, uh, of people up there. Uh, they, they come back at you with a bigger stuff than that. <laughs> they might come back But you are compared to Dog the Bounty Hunter quite a bit, which, is, which I found very intriguing. But l listen, Dog does a great job, and, you know, and it works for him. My job is a lot different. I, I need to be very close to my clients. You know, I, I use the word circle of love. I want my clients to know if they, if they jump bail or do something, they're hurting me and my family. I am a good person, but I could be a bad person if I have to be. So, again, since you're sometimes called the bank for the bad guys, let me ask a very direct question. If there is a bad guy, a person that did something horrible, and they come to you, and you provide them funding, folks could easily argue you're letting them out of jail, you could do more harm. How do you ensure that you're not doing harm to society by fulfilling your job? This is my business, Dr. Oz. This is what I do. Um, if, God forbid, uh, somebody shot a police officer, um, and he was rushed into a hospital, a doctor has to operate on him. Um, every day I deal with defense attorneys and they're dealing with people that in their minds they know they're guilty and they have to defend them. If, if there's a terrorist situation out there, there are defense attorneys that have to represent them. We don't agree with it, but that's their job and that's what I do. And I ensure the court that I'm getting these people back to court. And the court relies on me, DAs rely on me, judges rely on me, defense attorneys rely on me. And you help rich, poor, everybody. I do it all. I do the $1,000 bail, I do the $5 million bail. Let's zero in on Harvey Weinstein, who's more on the latter side. You helped get him released with, on a $2 million bail. That's correct. Right? What made you decide to work with Harvey? There's some personal risks to you taking a case of a gentleman who's generally not well regarded. W whether you like Harvey or you don't like Harvey, he, the judge ordered the bail, and the court asked me to come in and ensure Harvey's appearance in court. Um, I put an ankle monitor on Harvey. Uh, I worked with Harvey. I ensured the court to get Harvey to and from uh, court at all times. And, and again, we go back to the same thing. If I didn't do it, somebody else would do it. And that's my job. So you do your job, you get him back to court. Yes. You tried, the, senten the sentencing day comes. You're there at sentencing. I was there. What was it like? It was very tense. Um, there was a lot of media there. Um, soon as the verdict came down, there was a lot of shock for some people, 
happiness for some people. Um, right away, I was there to do my job. I had to go in the back and, and, and deal with taking the bracelet off Mr. Weinstein. He asked me some uh, business questions because it is a business for me, and we moved on. Do you ever feel guilty working with criminals, getting bad guys out? I feel guilty for the people that I don't get out, that I find out later on are, are innocent, and I decide to become judge and jury. Uh, I have a case uh, back in my early days when I decided to not or decline to take somebody out of jail, and I later found out that that person was innocent. And when I saw him later on, which he came into my office a couple months after the case was disposed of, he had a huge gash on the side of his face where he was sliced in prison. And I have to live with that for the rest of my life. And that, it's very tough to think about that, that that's what I did. To this, to this young man. I never thought about the other side of, of, if you make yourself judge and jury, you'll make mistakes the other way. Up next, exclusive details inside the phone call Ira had with the Photos Tulos uh, legal team and Photos just hours before he took his own life. What may have set Dulos off. Stay with us. The public outrage facing rapper T.I. Stan on the controversial virginity test. I think he did it out of protection. It's up to you. It's your choice, your body. We're weighing in. It's a wake-up call for the entire nation. That's coming up tomorrow. We're back with bail bondsman to the stars, Ida Jettleson. He's worked on many of the most infamous cases of our time, including the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. Now, we've been following the story since it broke. As a reminder, Jennifer went missing in May 2019. Her blood was discovered in the car of her estranged husband, Fotos Tulos, borrowed the day she vanished. Prosecutors accused Fotos of murdering her. While awaiting trial, Fotos Tulos decided a suicide attempt, and he succeeded. Jennifer Dulos' body has yet to be found. How, how did you get involved in this case? It was, it was so painful just to talk about it, much less get involved as a business. Well, uh, my understanding is the, the bond company was gonna revoke Fotos' bail on the day that uh, he committed or tried to commit suicide. I was called by Norm Pattis, who's an attorney who I've done business with in, in, in the past, who I happen to really love and respect. And uh, I, you know, I started to assess the risk, because that's what I do. And we started to talk. I had a discussion with his legal team. And uh, I had a discussion with, uh, I believe, Mr. Dulos, who happened to be in the, in the background, of what I was going to do, come in, step in, and write this $6 million bail. When you spoke to them on the phone, this was just hours before he was discovered in the garage, was anything in that conversation so negative that would have prompted him to commit suicide? I, I, sensed, I sensed the team was very uh, tense. I sensed the team was upset and, and, and didn't really know. It was kind of the 11th hour, and they needed me to come in. And look, I had to assess the collateral. I had to discuss different uh, particulars of getting one of my colleagues in Connecticut to write the bail. So it, it was a tense situation, and, and you felt it. You felt it on the phone. Were you surprised when you learned later that that same day he attempted suicide and ultimately succeeded? Dr. Oz was very shocked. And, uh, you know, when I found out later on that there was, there was a drone that, uh, that was overseeing what was happening and they saw Fotis' body on the ground, I, I was, you know, I was, I was shocked. Do you know the details of how he actually did it? Well, I mean, I believe it's carbon dioxide asphyxiation. I saw a pipe on the, uh, on the end of his tailpipe, which, you know, from later I found out through a lot of my police friends and law enforcement that, you know, to do something like that, you had to, you know, plan that out. And it, it took some time to put the pipe on the, uh, on the tailpipe. Yeah, and I think also there was an attachment, so it made sure that he would truly breathe in. Which works a lot quicker to, you know, to asphyxiate yourself. That's correct what I'm saying? Yes, Dr. Oz, that's correct. So he had planned this before he spoke I to think you. so. I look, Fotis, and I can't be in his brain, but he had financial trouble. Um, he had, he was not seeing his children. He had major fear of going back to jail. And uh, I think that plays a role in someone, you know, psyche. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know what he was thinking, but I, I sensed on that conversation with everybody that it was a tense situation. So what does justice look like for Jennifer Dulos now? We don't have her body, we don't even have a trial. I think the public is, is never gonna really know. I don't know if they're ever gonna find the body. Um, I, I do believe Mr. Uh, Pattis had a strong defense in his opinion. In my opinion, I, I really don't know too much about the case except that I was willing to step in and, and help and ensure the court again as my job that I was gonna bring Mr. Dulos back to court. But it, it, I, I think we're all gonna be up in the air. It could be another mystery unsolved. It does from the outside bother me that another bond company that knew this case pulled out. 
But why, why, why does a company do that? I mean, I cannot speak for the other bond company. It, 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 I don't know the technicalities of why they were uh, looking to pull out. I've written many large bonds, and that's why Norm came to me. Um, and uh, I know that if I came in, in which I was coming in, uh, I was going to be able to solve the problem both for you know the defense and the and, and also the DA side, so they could just worry about the case. Right, up next, not everyone agrees with, with what Ira does. When we come back, Ira goes face to face with a criminologist who says he's putting bad guys back on the streets. We're back with the bail bondsman to the stars, Ira Juddelson, who says it doesn't matter if you're innocent or guilty. He's going to lend you the money to get you out of jail. Is Ira given a free pass to bad guys to get out of jail? It's one of the hottest debates out there. And former criminologist Dr. Casey Jordan is on the other side of what Ira does. So, Dr. Jordan, you say folks like Ira just for the money, going out there, letting bad guys get free, where they can go out on the street and these criminals can perpetrate further crimes. Well, let's be clear. By his own admission, Ira is a businessman. He is in the banking business. And it's not his job, and he has said that, to be judge and jury and decide whether or not they're innocent or guilty. It's his job just to get them out. And the problem with that is that it's not his job to do risk assessment, but it raises the question, who is doing the risk assessment? If he gets these people out and they commit suicide, if they commit another crime, if they flee and become fugitives, he just shakes his hands and says, well, I'm doing my business. But somebody, something, some entity has to be in charge of figuring out who should get bail and who shouldn't. And I'm not sure that it's the judge and I'm not sure that it's Ira. Ira, what do you say to that? Well, number one, uh, the judge sets the bail. Number two, I'm giving someone an opportunity to fight their case from the outside if they're uh, innocent. And if they're guilty, hopefully set their family up and, and, and move forward. As far as assessing risk, I do assess risk. And I have skin in the game, and I make the families have skin in the game. And I'm monitoring my defendants, and I'm getting them to court, and I'm helping the judicial system move along. So I am part of the process, and that's what I do. Dr. Jordan, that, that reduces to actual reality. Weinstein, sh sh you, you believe Iris should have been involved with freeing Weinstein from jail so that he could watch the process from home? Well, here's some issues with Weinstein. He has no lack of money to make bail. And everyone's worried about a flight risk. Let's assume he's not a flight risk. But there are other things people can do on the outside besides preparing their case and setting up their family. And that includes intimidating witnesses, tampering with evidence. And in the last analysis, it's just incredibly disrespectful to the victims who allege that Harvey Weinstein was their rapist. And if you think about that, the message that sends, especially in the Me Too movement, that you can have somebody like Weinstein with no lack of money just saying I'm gonna walk around and I'm gonna tamper with my ankle bracelet you know and that's why his bail went up because he couldn't be trusted so it just sends a really bad message when only the wealthy can make bail Ira well again getting back to uh, mr. Weinstein um, his bail was increased uh, partly because of w what dr. Jordan said with the ankle bracelet but again I did not set bail on mr. Weinstein somebody uh, a judge did and in this country, you know, in, especially in New York, it's a bail state. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know Mr. Weinstein's financial situation. Um, some people could say it's good. Some people could say it's bad after everything that's going on with all his civil cases. But I was called in by the court. Uh, I have respect for the DA. I, I, I have respect for the judge. And I have the respect for the defense team. I was doing my job. And bringing Mr. Weinstein to court and ensuring that he gets back to court and then let the legal system take take its role. Look what happened as the legal system did take his role. He was sentenced to 23 years. Do you care about the emotional toll that women may have experienced because he was freed and able to, it seemingly anyway, uh, enjoy, enjoy is the wrong word, but thrive through the process at home? Well, I think they enjoyed the outcome of what took place. Um, as a moral person, I have daughters and I understand where people come from. But again, Dr. Oz, this is my job. I'm part of the process. So let me shift gears now. So bail reform is a very controversial topic in the news. It's even been blamed for more deadly criminal activity. I have strong feelings about this. Ira, as someone who's in the bail bonds business, what is your take on the bail reform that we're seeing nationwide? Well, nationwide, Dr. Oz, you could see that they tried bail reform all over this country. Um, it's not working in Colorado. It not working in Alaska, parts of uh, Illinois, it's not working, Delaware, and I could keep mentioning different states. New Jersey uh, actually changed its constitution and uh, made it a no bail state compared to New York, which is a bail state, which is very similar to like what in Jersey, China and Iraq that do that. We're not China and Iraq, we're, we're America. 
and uh, people have a right for bail. So right now there's a major public safety issue going on all over the country. All over the country, and it's scary. As a defense attorney, Casey, what do you think about the bail reform you've been witnessing? We do need bail reform, but remember, I'm an attorney, but also a criminologist. And the bail reform that we're seeing, I don't think really addresses the problem, because you can't have one size fits all. And it's going to be a challenge, but the answer, I think, is to have review panels made up of people like bail bondsmen and attorneys, social workers, criminologists, people who actually get the full picture of risk assessment so that they can decide, let's not punish the, the criminal, let's look at his or her crimes and decide whether or not, as a total package, that that person should be on the street. So let people who know about risk determine who gets bail and who doesn't. It shouldn't be a rich versus poor thing. All right. Look, I want to say on national television, I believe in some bail reform. Uh, I believe that the idea of bail reform was to help the people of not means to get out and not languish inside jail. But now what we're doing is we're helping the rich get richer because on white collar crimes, they're getting out and not paying bail. Grand larceny, identity theft. So if someone steals a victim's money, victimless people are sitting home by identity theft, there's no bail for them. They're getting right out. And nowadays, the DAs can't even attack their civil assets because what's going on with bail reform is they've tied up the DAs that way. Casey's right. We oh. should, yes. <laughs> And I'm going to say this right. We should sit in a room, and I'm, I'm urging, we should sit in a room with law enforcement, sitting judges, DAs, social people, bail bondsmen, and let's get it right. Let's be the first progressive state to get it right. Almost like I use the words, you watch football, instant replay. They stop the game, they look at it, and they say, hey, that guy was in bounds, he was out of bounds, that was a fumble, not a fumble. Let's get it right. We could do it. We could be the first state to get it right. Well, my friends who are judges are very upset about bail reform because they argue that we have a bunch of legislators who have now made decisions even though they're not in courts they're going to govern how judges and others make decisions that's not the point of the system the point of the system is to let people who are on the ground every day make wise moves you'll find out lots more from ira in his book the fixer the notorious life of a front page bail bondsman i want to thank you both dr jordan as well appreciate Good it to very be here. much be right back When we come back, it's Nacho Average Food Investigation. That's right, we're uncovering what your can nacho cheese and quesa are really made of. So stay tuned. We all know that bright orange glow of the nacho cheese dip we get at the movies or a ball game, right? It's a, it's a cheesy dose of nostalgia. It's equal parts sinful and addicting. And today, we're uncovering the surprising truth about how they are made. It is our nacho cheese investigation. But first, who knows their cheeses more than the French? We decided to bring in some French people to try American spray cheese for the very first time to determine whether it's fromage or fromage. The results were uh, very hilarious. In France, we live for cheese, we call it Fromage. J'adore le fromage. <laughs> cheese in a can like this, I never saw that before. How does it work? So you put your finger inside. <laughs> there we go. Mmm, très bien. Mmm, salé, très salé. I don't know how it works, because honestly. Because if you put your finger on the... Um, I really don't know how it works, this thing. No, I don't think it's like that. I'm surprised. I thought it's going to have an aluminium taste because it's in a can, but no, it's, it's, it's actually good. I'm surprised. No, I don't know. I think it smells like... Uh, a bad cheddar. Yeah, cheddar. <laughs> what do you think? Mmm. Mmm. No? No, it's actually very good. I do like it. Really? You're from France. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like, I don't know, like a sauce. But it's a sauce. It's not a cheese. <laughs> On 1 to 10, I will give this a minus 10. <laughs> well done to my French friends. Our team food investigator Ali Rosen joins us to break down for us what kind of nacho cheese are we talking about? What was so confusing to those French guests that we had? Yeah, so we're talking about cheese spreads, cheese dip, 
sprayable cheese, so it's not exactly regular cheese, but we see it as such. All right, so everyone wants to know the same basic question. Uh, is there really cheese in this cheese spray? Don't you think that, nacho cheese? Yeah. Is, there, is it really cheese? Yeah, so there is, like, We'll give them a break. There is cheese in this, but it all kind of comes down to semantics. When you look at the labels, it'll say cheese spread um, because it's only 51% cheddar cheese. So to be cheese spread, you have to be at least 51% cheese, but it's the other 49% that we're kind of wondering what that is. Let's go answer that question. What is in the other 49%? Ali did a deep dive into this. What exactly is making up our cheese spread that we adore so much? Yeah, so as you can see, it is a oh. lot of different ingredients, but we're gonna focus Focus on a few of kind of the worst and the biggest. So the first is whey, which you might know as the byproduct of when you're making cheese. It's that liquid that comes out, you know, curds and whey. Um, it's cheaper. I mean, it's essentially what they're doing. It's a cheese, it's part of cheese, but it's less expensive. So it's kind of what makes it more liquidy. We have sodium phosphate, which is the thing that kind of keeps everything together. It's the emulsifier. It makes sure that the liquids and the solids don't split apart, but it can also be used medically to cure constipation. So oh. not exactly what you want in your food. Uh, last but not least, we have the autolyzed yeast extract, which is basically MSG, but without the flavor of MSG. Uh, the other thing that's scary about this is that it's not required to be labeled the way that MSG is. So it's a cheaper version of it that you don't even see on the label. So it's all a little bit frightening. So how do they make the nacho cheese shelf stable? That's the part that's always thrown me off. Because most things like that, you gotta sort of put into yeah. the fridge mm -hmm. or freezer. This is unique. People, and it freaks people out for very good reason. Right, I mean, this is the stuff that it just sits on the shelf, you look at the date on it, it's like years away. Yeah. Um, it's chemicals, and then it's just a ton of salt. I mean, you saw it in that video, there's twice as much salt in these dips and in those spray cans as there is in your regular cheese. Yeah, so, the French guy said it's sel, it's right. salty, very salty. Right. So that's why you don't have to put, with most things like this, you have to put in the fridge. Right, I mean, you do with some of the ones that you open after they're open, but yeah, it's it's stable because it's a ton of salt and a lot of chemicals. And I guess if you're serving it at a ball game or a movie theater, it's too hard to put it in and out of the fridge. This way it's soft and creamy, you put it right on your nachos, off you go. Right. And it's a lot of those ingredients, the way it's keeping it creamy, and that's why it doesn't have the consistency of cheese. All right, bottom line, everybody, cheese, I think, ought to be simple. It ought to be cheese, right? It's already cheesy. Just keep it cheese. And because it's so darn delicious, you don't want to add a lot of chemicals to it. So we challenged Krissa, our physical kitchenist, to come up with a homemade, healthier case of dip. You can serve this in your party to all your guests in just five minutes. Be right back. It's queso time. Restaurant quality queso in just five minutes. Today, I'm making an easy, healthy queso dip that's a little untraditional, but oh, so good. And I'm gonna show you how. You're gonna heat one cup of almond milk and add to a blender. Then add raw cashews, canned green chilies, chili powder, cumin, and two tablespoons of nutritional yeast to give it that cheesy flavor. Blend it up until it's thick and creamy. I use this as a dip, I throw it in tacos, and sometimes when no one's watching, Mm-hmm, even that. The public outrage facing rapper T.I. Stan on the controversial virginity test. I think he did it out of protection. It's up to you, it's your choice, your body. We're weighing in. It's a wake-up call for the entire nation. That's coming up tomorrow. Right now, as I speak, someone is headed to the emergency room with an injury that could have been prevented, caused by something so innocent. The culprits, foods like these, avocados and pretzels. And now doctors are reporting more ER cases than ever before due to your favorite food, which is pizza. That's right. Today, a food 911 investigation. We uncover what you need to know so you don't end up in the emergency room. And joining me is ER doctor Samson Davis and comedian Chuck Nice to lay this all out. A recent finding really shocked me. In one year, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission found that 2,300 people went to the ER because of pizza-related accidents. I mean, how, who would even keep track of that? Dr. Davis, how is it impossible? 
2300 right? Can you imagine? <laughs> this is everything, though, from like carrying a pizza to burns, you name it, people are, are slices or cutting themselves by carrying a pizza, it all leads to ER cases, ER visits. And the other thing when it comes to burns, temperature as high as 120 degrees, which is common, yeah. can cause a first degree burn. Mm. So check, you're a world expert on this. People don't know this. That's He's right. Six days a week for a whole year, only with pizza. That's right. Well, not only. I had pizzas for six days a week oh. in one year. I worked next to a pizza shop, and it was amazing. <laughs> I loved it. But, uh, yeah, I do love pizza. It's my favorite food, you know? You ever burn your tongue in any of these ER accidents? I'm going to be very honest. Does the pizza ever bite you back is what I want to know. It, of course. And it's about time pizza starts biting back. I should have gone to the ER because I got burned once. You ever burn yourself so bad that the roof of your mouth becomes Ooh. like chopped meat? Yes. And it's like kind of little pieces of skin are hanging. Your hamburger. But this is how good pizza is. <laughs> I finished the pizza! <laughs> <laughs> Who has been there? Who here? Put your hands up. Raise your hands. Who's burned their mouth with pizza? Dr. Davis, put your hands up. Come on, Dr. Davis. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Please, of course. Pizza Everybody's on the go. All right, so <laughs> you're not alone. I want to do my own pizza test. We sent the med unit. They hit three popular pizza joints to find out just how hot a slice is when it's fresh out of the oven. And what is it safe to take that very first bite? So, you guys ready for the results? Oh, yeah. We're going to like this. All right, all right. Right out of the oven, as soon as it comes out, the average pizza slice at these restaurants, 226 degrees. Wow. That is close to the optimal temperature we brew coffee at. Wow. Now, 160 degrees is hot enough to give you a burn or a nasty blister. 120 is not for some people. But at 10 minutes, it was 124 degrees. Right now, I personally like mine a little hotter than that. Yeah. So maybe five minutes could compromise. Absolutely. Take you where you need to be. You all good with that? Yeah. So five minutes rest time. Let the, it's like a good piece of meat. Yes. Let it settle Let it for rest. a second. Let it rest. So I'm not a fan of cold pizza. Oh. You obviously are having no issues with it. I well, know. listen, I love pizza that much, but I, I enjoy, like, really hot pizza. So how do you prevent yourself from getting burned? All right, so I'm going to show you two ways, okay? First is the New York way, all right? Because <laughs> New Yorkers, you get, this is some of the best pizza in the world, okay? And what New Yorkers do is, first of all, you fold it, which, by the way, makes it even hotter, okay? <laughs> That's right. It stores the heat. It stores the heat. And then what you want to do is you want to take a nice bite, mm-hmm, and then... Cool it down. Cool it down. Ventilate it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Of course, and you cool it in your mouth. <laughs> what? Now, the not recommended, by the way. Not recommended. Not re now, the second way, people are going to hate me for this, but it's physics proven. What you want to do is increase the surface area of the pizza, and you do that by creating more sides to the pizza. So no, you, don't you, say it. I'm don't gonna, say it. You, see, he's a man of oh, science, please. so he already knows where I'm going to create more size to the pizza and increase the surface area, which actually causes it to cool faster. You have to cut it with a fork and knife. Yeah. I know. Look at this, my career is over. I'm a hated man now, but that is the quickest way to cool the pizza. And by the way, you can cut it with a fork and knife and you can eat it. And by the time you get down to this part, which is at the crust, you just fold that over, dip it in some olive oil, and eat it like you normally would. You know, I gotta say, as <laughs> whack and crazy, that's not a bad way of going. It really and is. And it saves you from having raw meat in your mouth. Right. All right, the next food that can send you to the ER is a very popular snack. You wanna show it? Okay. A deli surveillance camera caught at the moment when this employee ch almost choked to death on these, mm. on potato chips. Look at this here, all right? Choking on small foods happens a lot more than you think. Watch her, she's choking, she's choking. Her colleague comes in there, she, she's asking, are you doing okay? No, I'm not doing okay, help me. And they say, well, is that, well, it's not a very aggressive, that's more like a hug. Mm. And it doesn't really work, she's still choking. And she's still choking. Now she's reaching into her mouth to get it out. We oh. laugh now, but there's abject panic going on here. But guess who saves the day? Guess who saves the day? Yep, the first responders. He pulls twice to, to get it out, and guess what happens? She spits it on the ground. He saved her life. Nice. You wow. saw it right there. Caught perfectly at a surveillance camera. Now, I suspect something similar may have happened to President George W. Bush but when he choked on it. So he's had a pretzel, a pretzel, I think. A pretzel. That was a pretzel. Yeah. Same kind of thing. It's perfectly shaped for your vocal cords in mm -hmm. your throat. So, Dr. Davis, what other surprising foods could we die on? I mean, this is, what, getting serious here, people choke to death on these things. Yeah. Right, so. absolutely. I mean, the most common, as you know, are your meats. But small items such as popcorn, hot dogs, bread, Candy, especially mm -hmm. kids moving around, jumping up and down on a sofa. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you go for that. <laughs> this can cause a this can cause a choking incident. So you have to be very careful. Make sure to chew 
obviously uh, thoroughly before swallowing and, and sit still. As so can. we showed that video, everybody, and we're sort of smiling here because we know it had a happy ending. But you have five minutes. Yeah. Right. Five minutes for the choking with no oxygen going to your brain can mm -hmm. cause irreversible damage. So I want everyone to know what to do if they see someone choking. Now, that lady did the right thing. She said, are you okay? You okay? Right? right. If they're talking to you, say, I feel badly. I feel like I'm... They're not choking. If you can move air back and forth in your throat, you are not choking, especially kids. Right. If they go, Mommy, I'm choking, I'm choking. No. Shut up, you drama queen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just sort of calm them down. But if you can't breathe, they go like this, the universal thing is right. like that. Then you may have heard the Heimlich maneuver. It's not called that anymore. It's called the abdominal thrust maneuver. Okay, that sounds sexy. <laughs> All right, demonstrate the abdominal thrust in a legal way. Okay, so uh, we have a... Uh, look at this. We're two dummies. All right. Um, <laughs> but you... you, you uh, from what I understand is you're supposed to come up behind the well, person. First, first, there's something that's important. Go ahead. You bang their back. Oh. Like five times. See, I was told never to do that, but now we do that. Yeah. One, two, three, four. four. Five. That actually didn't work. That didn't work. So if they turn around and punch you, you know they're no longer choking. <laughs> <laughs> Hit them. Right. Then, from what I understand, is you make a fist, yep. right? You turn your thumb inwards. Perfect. Mm -hmm. You grab the outside of your fist. Yep. You put the knuckle portion up under that little area right here where your rib cage comes together in an apex. You pull it there, and you go, don't worry, bro, I got you. <laughs> and you, two. Three, three, four, four, five, and then wait, and then see it again. One, two, three, four, <coughs> and he goes. You got it out, and then. Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Remember who saved you. Remember who saved you. Man. <laughs> All right, now. That's actually perfectly done. Really? It's, okay. not, it's not any more difficult than that. And Chuck did it first time perfectly. And that will usually work. In the meantime, people come and help you. Now, what if you're by yourself, Dr. Davis? Ooh. So if you're by yourself in your home or wherever you are, a restaurant, you want to use any items. Right here, we have a chair. You use a countertop. You want to take your fist, make the same uh, fist that Chuck made here. You put it right above your belly button and positive <clears throat> upward force. <clears throat> as strong as you can. <clears throat> <laughs> and that would expel the food. Cough it out. <laughs> and anything that puts pressure upward like that will work. Unfortunately, this guy is going to die because he has no arms. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, next, has this ever happened to you? Take a look. OK, here is your friendly reminder to wash your hands after cutting jalapenos, because then it itched my nose. I got ice right here. And I'm just like, oh, cooling off my nose. I'm just switching from nostril to nostril cooling down my porn and nasal airway. <sighs> Birdie. <gasps> Ow, in my eyeball! In my eye. Oh, oh. Yeah, don't do that. Chuck knows exactly all about this problem. He loves spicy foods. Yes. Dr. Samson, you have personal expertise. This is the spicy finger dilemma solution that only the ER docs know. You got a little hack. Very simple. I, I use this in the hospital as well, these rubber gloves right here. You just make sure you put the rubber gloves on when you're handling the food, the peppers and everything. You're cutting away. And when you're done, you just have to make sure to take the uh, gloves off, but take it off properly at the heel of the glove. Therefore, you avoid getting the capsaicin in your eye. If you really want to do so, it right, go on. So easy for two doctors to say, just get some surgical gloves. <laughs> <laughs> They're cheap. They're <laughs> like this. <laughs> You're done. All right, when we come back, our Food 911 continues with meal prep dangers. Also, we investigate. Can you really slip on a banana peel? Think about it. with our Food 911 investigation revealing the unexpected foods that can send you to the emergency room. I got burns, got all kinds of things, but this is what I'm really worried about. Doctors sent warning signs literally to, uh, to each other about cutting avocados. If you made a diagnosis for this type of injury, it's called avocado hand. Notice, notice the avocado on the left that's partially cut through. Notice the hand on the right that's also partially cut through. So Chuck, explain why cutting one of these babies these avocados can be so dangerous. You know, I'm, I'm going to blame all the cooking shows that we see on TV. Yes. <laughs> Seriously, because people see these cooking shows and these chefs have these super sharp knives and you see them like... <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and that's the actual sound it makes. And, uh, and people think that they can do that at home, okay? So it's about safety. 
So I wanted to find out from a pro how to cut a co and a, an avocado the safest way possible. So I called on the vegetable butcher herself, Kara Mangini from Little Eater. Take a look. Hey, Dr. Oz, I'm gonna show you how to cut an avocado without cutting your hand. You'll need a sharp chef's knife. It'll help prevent you from trying too hard and cutting yourself. Accidents happen all the time when people try and use a knife with a dull blade. You'll also need a cutting board to rest the avocado, a folded kitchen towel to protect your hand and assist with grip, a butter knife to cut the flesh of the avocado, and a spoon to scoop it out. To start, stand your avocado upright on the cutting board and cut it in half lengthwise, working around the pit. Twist the halves in opposite direction and pull them apart. Here's where the kitchen towel comes in. Place the half with the pit in your hand with the kitchen towel and strike the center of the pit and twist to release it. Use the towel to carefully remove the pit and switch to the butter knife. Now, cut even slices without breaking the skin and cut across to dice it. Use the spoon to scoop the avocado out. And that's how you cut an avocado safely like a pro. So, I'm, I'm just holding pressure on the bleeder for a second. <laughs> Chuck's been following along with the vegetable butcher steps. He didn't do so. You have all your fingers? Let me just see here. One Are they all there? Let me just take this a second. Did you have all 10 fingers? Hold them up. <laughs> nah. <laughs> It wasn't bad, huh? It's Not pretty bad. simple. I gotta tell you, that's uh, what she did. It's super safe, and I think the real key is turning the avocado. Okay, next, something I've always wanted to investigate. Are you ready for this? <laughs> this baby. Can you really slip on one of these? That's the question. People all over the world tried this little challenge. Wasn't very smart, but take a look. Here's the banana peel. Look, banana peel on the floor. <laughs> Not slippery, so. Wanna give it a try? Here, hang on, I'm turning it around there for you. Go. <laughs> it's actually slippery. I probably should go. I'm really scared. Whoa! Whoa! Wait. Go again. You gotta be kidding me. The banana, the banana peel slip gag. It's a comedy staple. Why? You're the I, comedian. I, you know, I, first of all, I don't even get this. Why don't we have a challenge? Hey, what happens when you hit your hand with a hammer? Like, we already <laughs> know the answer. Yes, they slip. When they slip on a banana peel in a movie, they did not slip on the banana peel, okay? They did this. <laughs> and then the camera went to another angle, and they're laying on the ground. So, you know, that's the way you're supposed to slip on a banana peel safely. <laughs> so the, vi the viral fat, thankfully, is coming gone, but your fear about banana peels has not. Why is that? This, I mean, this is real. The banana peel is actually more slippery than any other fruit, because uh, it contains a molecule, a polysaccharide, which there was a study, and a Nobel Prize was won in 2014 by a team that studied this. No, a Nobel Prize? A Nobel Prize was won, exactly. And, and so you just want to be sure to make sure you survey your terrain, where you're walking, where you're stepping to before... Wait a minute, forward. they gave a Nobel Prize to somebody who said that slipping on a banana peel is slippery? Because of the polysaccharide. <laughs> they just giving anybody a Nobel Prize now. They're desperate, they're desperate. Yeah. Well, since you got polysaccharides, and let's use them for well-being, we can make a face mask out of these babies. Really? So you can take your knife and scrape, see that little bell oh, pectin yeah, in there? That whole thing that's Take this off. little baby right there, put that inside of your yogurt, mix that up. Sure thing. Meanwhile, I'm gonna be cutting a little effectively a dispenser item, a little, uh, an organic tool. Oh. You got honey, yogurt, the, the, the peel of the banana. Oh my God, it's delicious. Yes, but here, ser serve that up, Samson. There we go. There, there we, we are. Go. So this serves as a... A little bit to you, Chuck, for being such a wonderful person. Okay. You can eat it, you can put it on your face, apply it, leave it on for about 15, 20 minutes. Folks make fun of you. Oh, please, look at this. This is the problem I'm seeing. There's the problem I am. Listen, you can check out Dr. Davis's book, Living and Dying in the Brick City. Chuck Nice, just find the guy. Follow him on Instagram. Have a good time with him. We'll be right back. <laughs> the public outrage facing rapper T.I. Stan on the controversial virginity test. I think he did it out of protection. It's up to you. It's your choice, your body. We're weighing in. It's a wake-up call for the entire nation. That's coming up tomorrow. I'm set. Good boy. Answer. 
Good boy. As you just saw, Tisha and Old Dog do tricks may now include math. Can you believe it could do that? The dog will bark as many times as the numbers he holds up. And a new study says that dogs can actually count and process numbers like humans. Beth and her dog, Kobe, is here. How are you guys? Very well. Thank you so much you for look having at us. Kobe and wonder, what's Kobe thinking? What's going on in Kobe's brain? I do. Um, Kobe's actually a therapy dog, and I often wonder what he's thinking when the young children are reading to him at school. What, what do you think Kobe's thinking right now? I think Kobe's thinking that he loves to be here, and he's loving all the attention, and would like to be a TV star. All right, let's teach Kobe. <laughs> so, new study looked at 11 different breeds. They specifically looked at their brains. Come on back. Here's what they specifically found, which I'm stunned by, right? This is the dog brain. It's the front of the brain, the back of the brain. And these lit up areas are parts of the brain that are being used. And this specific portion of the brain is used to compute quantities. It's similar to the regions that we have in our human brain, right? It's a number response neural pattern. So if I ask you to identify number of dots or quickly assess how many are here and how many are there, you use these parts of the human brain, right? It's very similar to the dog brain. And researchers think this comes from dogs' evolutionary need to know how many predators were around, right? Or the amount of squirrels they should chase. So come on down, Kobe, I got a question for you. Right? How does this new research change what you think about Kobe's ability to do stuff, like keep track of what you're up to? Well, I wish I would have known this sooner. I would have had him do my taxes. <laughs> you, could have done, you could have done the taxes. The fact, unfortunately, we don't know which breeds. They said the 11. We don't know which is the best, which is the worst, but they're all pretty good at it. And dogs are a lot smarter than you think, apparently. So watch out. You may want to be careful shortchanging them on the number of treats you give them. I see what you got in your hands. Yes. <laughs> Remember, everyone, the power of change lies in the power of you. One person with one voice speaking the truth. It's powerful. Goodbye, everybody.